Now we are going to move on to the lectures. First, Dr. Ko Nishino will deliver a lecture whose title is Seeing with AI. Dr. Ko Nishino is a professor in the Department of Intelligence Science and Technology at Kyoto University. He received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Information and Communication Engineering in 1997 and 1999, respectively, and PhD in Computer Science in 2002, all from the University of Tokyo. Before joining Kyoto University in 2018, he was a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Drexel University. His primary research interests lie in computer vision and machine learning, including appearance modeling and material recognition, human behavior analysis, and computational photography. He received the NSF Career Award in 2008. Before the lecture, I'd like to let you know that you can use hand raising button in the bottom of your Zoom display during this session. If the lecturer tells you to raise your hand during the lecture, please use the button. When the lecturer tells you to put your hands down, please make sure to push the button again. Also, please make sure to stay your hands down unless the lecturer gives you the instruction so that we can see your reactions uh, very well. The lecturer can see how many people and who are raising their hands on his display. So let's react to him actively. Now we are going to start his lecture. Dr. Nishino, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Ko, and I want to talk about computer vision. Okay, so how many of you have heard of computer vision? Let's see by show of hands. Can you click on the, uh, the raise your hand button if you have heard of computer vision? And uh, how about artificial intelligence? Anybody have heard of artificial intelligence? Okay, so computer vision is the eye of AI, whose goal is to try to make computers see. We as human beings use our eyes to collect visual information and then use our brains to process them to make sense of the visual world surrounding us. The goal of computer vision is to replace that eye with a camera and the, the brain with a computer. And by making computers see, we can do all sorts of things that we cannot do otherwise. For instance, we can show virtual objects like virtual furniture, Pokemons on your smartphone where you just take a picture of the scene in front of you. Or doctors will be able to see human organ in 3D so that they can plan precision surgery or even robotic surgery. Robots will be able to recognize you, understand what you're feeling so that they can plan better about how to interact with you. And soon you'll be able to just sit back in a car as it drives itself without worrying about causing an accident. And all sorts of all these things are done with computer vision. And it's useful, important, and you're starting to see them in your daily lives. And in our research group, we're not just trying to make computer, computers see, but also perceive, trying to elevate computer vision as a truly intelligent perceptual modality that deeply understands the rich visual world around us. And towards this goal, we are trying to we are centering our research on three pillars, understanding people, not just tracking or recognizing people, but trying to understand what they're thinking, what their intents are, what their goals are, just from the way that they behave. Understanding objects, not just recognizing what it is in front of us, but also trying to gauge how heavy it is, how hard it is, so that we can plan how to pick it up. And also computational photography, trying to marry computing with cameras so that we can redefine imaging itself, so that we can see things that even we don't see. So let me show you an example of research that we do on understanding people. So when you're looking at your friend and trying to gauge what he's thinking, 
one of the most critical inf visual cues to understand that person is the gaze direction, what the person is looking at. And if we can tell what the person is looking at while he moves around, say for instance, in a room, it will tell us a lot about what the person is thinking. And we came up with a way to tell what the person's gaze direction is just by modeling how the body and the head orientation and gaze orientation are coordinated so that we can just look at you from far away and tell what you're looking at. And this is quite a powerful technique because now we are able to tell the gaze direction without looking at the eyes and even when the person is facing away from the camera. And we want to extend this so that we can help elderly uh, have a better life in their rooms. For another project, we came up with a way to rec re reconstruct human body from casually taken videos. Say for instance, you have a friend who's practicing pitching and you want to give him some really concrete advice about how to use his elbow. By just taking a video of the person who's pitching multiple times and you change the viewpoint sparsely a couple of times, we show that you can recover the full 3D body shape just from that casually taken video using your smartphone and reconstruct the human body action in full 3D. So that now you can actually scrutinize how that person is moving his hand or twisting his body later on and give some concrete advice. And this is quite a powerful technique. And imagine having that in your smartphone. You can use it to brush up your skateboard tricks. Now, on understanding objects, we've done a lot of work in recognizing materials. Now, computer vision has made large strides in object recognition, recognizing what the object in front of you is, or that there's a cup. But say, for instance, in the left bottom image, telling that there's a chair is not enough to decide how to interact, move around in that room. We need to know what they are made of. We need to be able to tell that, okay, we are driving on a wet concrete road, so we should break earlier. So we came up with a way to recognize materials using deep learning techniques by leveraging both local appearance and global contextual cues so that we can now tell that in the left bottom image that there's a chair made of fabric on a wooden floor in a room with plaster walls with glass windows. So now robots will be able to plan ahead of time before actually making actions how fast that they can walk without slipping on the wooden floor and how hard they can land on the soft fabric chair. Now, as we just saw, computer vision is about really understanding what's behind the image, right? Whether that be the person's intent or the materials. But at the very physical level, Images are made of pixels, and those pixels are basically light, right? Now then, what, what is light, right? At this very moment in this room, this room is filled with light, bouncing around in all different directions, in your room too. But have you thought about what light is? If you have any ideas, you can tell me in the Q&A box. What is light? Well, light, as you have learned in your school, is a ray, right? It's a straight line coming out from a light source, hitting a surface, eventually coming into your eye. That's why you see objects, right? But is it just a ray? You've also learned that it's a wave, right? It's an electromagnetic wave with two oscillating sinusoids in perpendicular planes in a direction uh, perpendicular to the transverse direction. So it's a transverse wave uh, aligned with the ray, right? Now in college, you'll also learn that light is also a particle. It's a particle that can bump electrons that can raise energy so that you can actually record an image as a digital image. And that's called a photon. But for most computer vision applications, ray optics and wave optics are sufficient. Now let's think about these really simple facts. Light is a ray and a wave. Let's just take the ray part. What's the representative property of light as a ray? If you have any ideas, you can type it in the Q&A box. So ray, the most representative property is that reflects, right? 
Now, I used to be a professor in the USA for 13 years, and I lived there for 15 years. So when I came back to Japan to start living in Kyoto, just like any tourist who would visit Kyoto would do, I went to the Golden Temple and took this image. And many of you have probably seen this kind of an image. And in many of the temples in Kyoto, you have the lake, you have a pond in front of the temple so that you can actually appreciate not just the direct view of the temple, but also the nice reflection of it in a single view, right? Now, what's going on in this image? Well, if you look at the tip of the temple, that tip is emanating a light ray that goes straight into your eye or the camera, right? But that tip is also emanating light in all different directions, some of which will actually bounce off the water surface and come into the camera. So you see the reflection of the temple too, right? Now, what is what, this reflection? Well, you've learned in school that if you have a reflected view, you basically have a virtual viewpoint at the same distance behind the reflector, right? You have a virtual viewpoint. You've learned that, right? If you face a mirror, there's a virtual you behind the mirror looking at you, which is the reflection of yourself. So this means that in this single image, you actually have two viewpoints, one direct view and one from the bottom of the lake looking up the temple, right? Now, what does that mean? Doesn't this remind you of something? You have two eyes to look at one object, two rays coming into your two eyes, so that you can actually triangulate that point to measure the depth. That's why you see 3D. That's called stereo vision, but this is just a vertical version of that, right? It's not horizontal, it's vertical, which suggests that from this single image that I took in Kyoto, I should be able to recover the 3D geometry of this temple. So here's another example of a night-lit Byodoing, a famous temple in Uji. Now, if we cut out the surface, water surface reflection part and make it upside right, you indeed see a vertical disparity. One view directly, one view from the bottom, right? And better yet, water reflection is governed by what is called Fresnel reflection, which is incident angular dependent, which means that the brightness of that point is dependent on the direction that it came in, which means that you have two observations of the same scene point with different brightness. And if you have the same scene point captured in two brightness, you can fuse them together to recover HDR, which means that from a single image, you can actually get not just 3D, but also HDR appearance. And in fact, you can do it fully automatically. Just cap, uh, find three correspondences to isolate the water surface, and then recover stereo reconstruction to get 3D, and also HDR, uh, HDR appearance, and voila, you get a really nice 3D model just from that casually taken image of the temple. And in fact, you can apply this for a wavy pond like this case, and get a 3D model of the Golden Temple. And you can also apply that to any image of water reflection that you downloaded from the internet, like this nice bird. You suddenly get a nice 3D model. OK? Now, let me switch gears and ask you a simple question. Why is this apple red? We just saw that light as a ray reflects, then if you have an apple under a white illumination, it should look white, right? Because light is reflected. White light is reflected off the surface. Why is it red? Anybody in the Q&A? So it turns out that when light hits a surface, some of the light immediately bounces off. That's specular reflection or surface reflection but some of it actually penetrates the interface and goes inside the object. And the light that goes inside the object will bounce around hitting all the different particles in the subsurface and eventually come out and come into your eye. But when it's bouncing around in that subsurface, when it hits the particle, it gets absorbed. And for a red object, the green and blue light gets absorbed, and the red will remain intact, which means that the light that eventually comes out will be red, which is why this apple is red. So light gets absorbed, which explains something, right? Water is transparent because it doesn't absorb light, right? That makes sense. But is water always transparent? 
Well, the light that we actually see is actually not all the lights that's possible in this world. Light is an electromagnetic wave, but it, that wave can have different wavelengths. It can be really, really short, like 10 to the minus 15 meters of cosmic rays coming from space, or a bit longer, like 10 centimeters that you use for microwaves to heat up your food. We actually only see a very tiny fraction of that called the visual human visual spectrum from basically 400 nanometers to 800 or 700 nanometers, blue to red. And the way that light behaves is very wavelength dependent. And in fact, water does not absorb light in the visual spectrum between 400 to 700 nanometers, but it does in the near infrared range from 800 to 1000. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you have a near infrared uh, filter and you keep on pouring water in a cup, it will become darker and darker because the thicker the water is, the more the light has to travel and thus gets absorbed more in that wavelength and becomes darker, right? That's interesting, right? Now, this can actually be written down as a very simple equation called the Baer-Lambert law, which says that the incident light exponentially decays as it travels distance d multiplied by a scalar alpha, which is the wavelength dependent absorption coefficient. And it turns out water's absorption coefficient is really dramatically changing in the near infrared range from 600 to 1000. It linearly goes up. So if you use a 1000 nanometer filter, water is actually pitch black. Now, what, what does this mean? What can we use this for? So this got me to think that maybe if we look at the same object in water, at the same viewpoint, but with two different near-infrared wavelengths, because of the difference in the absorption coefficients, we can actually take the ratio of the observed intensities and measure the distance the light traveled in water, which in other words means you can measure the distance to the object, which in other words means that you can recover the 3D shape. So we set off to build a camera like that with a beam slip splitter, and voila, you can get a really nice 3D reconstruction of a dynamically happily swimming fish in a water tank. And the distance is color coded here with, where yellow is closer to the observer. And recently we extended this to use multiple wavelengths to directly measure also not just the depth distance, but also the surface normal, which is the orientation of the surface points so that we, we, can, we can recover all these minute details of the fin of the Singapore fighting fish like this. And we are trying to extend this technology to colonoscopy, for instance, so that we can recover human organs from the inside to aid medical diagnosis. Now, we saw that light reflects and gets absorbed, but it also polarizes, meaning that it gets polarized. So the oscillating plane of that sinusoidal transverse wave can actually be oriented in different directions. And in fact, surface reflection causes polarization. So if you have an unpolarized light, meaning an oscillating light in all different directions uniformly hit the surface, that light that's specularly reflected will be polarized in a direction parallel to the plane. And the light that penetrates that surface will be polarized in the opposite direction, perpendicular to the plane. And you might have actually known this from experience that if you use a polarized sunglass to look at a water puddle, because those polarized sunglasses have gratings that are parallel to the gravity direction, it will block all the surface reflection light, thus the water surface reflection, so that you can see inside the water puddle. Right? That's useful for fishing. And you might think that light is unpolarized if it's not reflected. And that's true for room lights and sun. In fact, if you look up the blue sky, you have the sun, and that sun is passing over you, and that sun is unpolarized. But it turns out that that unpolarized sunlight gets scattered by all the aerosols in the sky, which is basically reflected, which polarizes that light. And if you have a polarization camera, you can see all these angles of different angles of our orientations of the polarization spanning the entire sky. It's beautiful. And that means that if you're actually looking at the object captured outdoors, 
that will have a polarization pattern that's basically the sky polarization pattern modulated by the surface normals on the object surface. Now this got us to think that maybe by matching the beautiful patterns on the observed image to the sky polarization pattern, we can recover the surface normals of every single point on the object. I mean, in other words, recover the 3D geometry of that object. And that's basically what we did. By just staring at the car, taking one picture with the polarization camera on a clear blue sky, you can recover its sh shape and a uh, really complex shape like this lion statue too, and also apply that to every frame of a video that you capture outdoors of a deforming object like this pump. So you can reconstruct the deforming 3D shape by just looking at it outdoors. Okay, so there you have it. These are the kind of research that we do in our lab towards understanding people, understanding objects, and trying to see what even we don't see. And these might have looked difficult, but remember that we start with really simple questions and simple principles that you even learn in elementary school. We start with wishful thinking. What if we could do this? Wouldn't it be really cool? And then we go to our desk and sit down and use math, physics, and computing, and lots of thinking to really nail the question and derive a solid solution. So remember that all the studies that you're currently undertaking and all the simple questions that you come up with are actually the foundation of serious scientific research. So hopefully one day you'll join us in this really exciting quest. Thank you.